I know we're starting the, um, a, a bit late. There was someone in the audience who, I, I, this slide is not directly related to my talk, but someone I, I spoke to on the first evening said something about, are there really volcanoes in Africa? Are they dangerous? There's, there's not much activity in Africa, is there? And I always, I, I thought, well, there's an opportunity to educate. This is a school. In this diagram here, all of the boxes enclosed confirmed either eruptions or um, intrusions that reach near the surface, and at relatively large volume uh, intrusions in all of those boxes. And the one in the left, this near Gongo, Nemeragira, there's actually, I'll show you a picture, I think, at one point, um, or at the, in the, in the preparation for our laboratory this afternoon, two, 50, two um, volcanoes 15 kilometers apart, both with lava lakes that are, have really exciting activity as well. Uh, lava lakes, the longest lived lava lake on Earth is at Earth Ale Volcano, or continuous in Earth Ale. And many of these are volcanic islands in the southern Red Sea. And there are more volcanoes showing signs of unrest or high pressure um, per. Um, unit length uh, along the East African Rift than there are along the Andes. So, yes, magmatism is a critically important process in that part of the world, and it's what draws me back um, to uh, field, in, on, uh, field studies as time goes on and on. Now, I, I feel really privileged to, to have the opportunity to speak to you here. I... Um, I, my, I, less than, the, or unlike the other speakers that we've had so far at the meeting, I, I'm not a theoretician. I work with theoreticians and trying to acquire the most critical pieces of information and the data sets uh, and make those, and, and to integrate them and work closely. Uh, I, I, I think that what I'm trying to present to you is that um, taking the theory doing sensitivity analyses and knowing exactly what observations are critical to a problem or what motivate my research, and I, I hope it's part of the reason that I, I'm presenting here at the meeting. Now, what I wanted to talk about, I've been working, uh, what I'm, I'm presenting now uh, are volcano and um, magmatic intrusion and fluids, fluid movements within the crust in areas that are, are in extension. And I, at the very end, I'll comment about um, magmatic systems in compressional environments. But I want to try to emphasize the point that, that's been made elsewhere, that, that uh, particularly with Torsten's talk, that there's also a tectonic driving stress that may or may not um, be coincident with the, um, the body forces induced by the magma magmatism itself, its density contrast and the surface topography. And so the state, knowing the state of stress is a really important part of any um, setting up any problem in these areas. So I, let me continue on. The other, so the, I have two parts. I want to talk and continue on from what Torsten was presenting and talk about some ongoing problems within dike, uh, with dike intrusions and challenges we face in trying to apply rate state friction. I also wanted to say that I, I I'm trying to work with really smart people who are trying to extract information on the dimensions and the distribution of melt and its pathways, not just in the chambers and directly beneath the volcanoes or in these larger volume dike intrusions, but actually um, from the mantle to the surface. And some of the physical property information and the differences in the different methods are starting to show a promise in being able to understand those aspects. So I'll touch on those. I'm covering uh, a lot without, um, and it, with the methods, because of your diverse backgrounds, I won't say too much about the methods. I hope you trust that what I've chosen are published papers with really reliable data sets and interpretations. Okay. Um, so my, I'm getting used to these. I so say what I'll do is, um, because Torsten just presented uh, so much on, on dike and sill intrusions and sill, Simply and not completely, let's take a dike and turn it sideways. Obviously, its relation to the free surface is quite different. But in, in many ways, we can think about the stress concentrations along the edges then of these zones uh, where this, uh, the intrusions are occurring. Um, I'm going to talk about detecting melt and fluid pathways and then 
briefly talk on de separating out source effects, source effects in terms of the volcano sources um, and, and uh, fault uh, magma interactions versus passing wa seismic waves passing through fractured material that may have gas or even aqueous fluids within them and how that will change then what, what and how we interpret signals from volcanoes. And that leads then to what we'll do this afternoon. Is, and this afternoon is more looking and having you um, evaluate some data sets from uh, a very active volcano in East Africa, uh, from Niragongo volcano. So why, where am I going? Um, the other part that I want to talk about as well is um, the presence or the, the clues that we gain from active process, obviously, detecting, seeing a particular volcanic eruption in real time. We gain a, a, a large insight, but understanding the time average strain patterns is an additional constraint we can put on these problems. Are, are the conditions that we're seeing at any point then um, changing with, are, are they relevant over longer time periods and how does that change the density distribution and the structure within the plate zones? So here's a really simple, um, in a way, it's a cartoon. And it's just meant to hit on a variety of processes. And, and I think we all know that we can have volcanoes and lava and, and extrusive lavas at the surface. We can have complex systems within the crust, but there's other things beneath the crust, and we're generating, generating the melt in, in, in most cases through adiabatic decompression melting. Um, enhanced temperatures in some areas then will change, increase these problems, or through the addition of volatiles in the subduction zone setting. Um, but I'm drawing the, the rift zone um, example because it's the one I'm the most familiar with, and most of my examples, my examples will come from there. I want to point out then that we have, we have, we may be, in, we're introducing fluids from beneath the plate and they're rising through the plate, sometimes stalling and freezing and then maybe being uh, reheated again. In other cases then rising very quickly from the mantle to the surface. A kimberlite is an example of a lava that rises, it's filled with a CO2 gas that basically bursts up through the plate in maybe a week or two. Uh, there are melatites, melilitites that may come up in a couple of days from um, the base of the crust as well. So really fast depending on the volatile content. So volatiles are really important in the process. The changing boundary conditions within the tectonic situation though are all, can also become important in terms of fluxing um, and changes in the distribution of the surface topography or even migrating uh, volcanoes. You know, we talked about the sisters before in terms of local stresses, but in many cases that the boundary conditions are going to change over time periods of hundreds of thousands of years or a million years, and so the volcano may be more or less favorable in a more or less favorable situation. So I'm not going to worry about the time evolution of systems. I'm just trying to place it in context. But one process I really wanted to emphasize is that we know that in former subduction zones that we may, that subduction process itself may have rehydrated the mantle lithosphere. So we may have an additional contribution of, of fluid volatiles, particularly water and CO2 that are able to participate in the magmatic process in addition to the magmatic fluids that are generated down here. And so this process of metasomatism, metasomatized mantle can also happen um, by reinjection or the addition in, of, of fluids uh, through mantle plume processes. And so we know ocean island basalts are enriched. And ma um, many of these mantle plume provinces have very, uh, and have unusually large amounts or, or, of, um, or larger amounts of CO2 gases. So we can, we have more gas than just the volcanoes themselves in many settings. And then I'm going to talk about an exceptional one, and that's the edge of the Archean Craton in Tanzania, where the, you know, you'll see in a minute, CO2 degassing and water degassing as well are important components of the process and the, and the failure process. So they're changing the status of. So down below on the bottom part of the diagram is 
a, a diagram that actually Michael Manga had, he had also stresses against it. I've just put the process versus the time scales over which they are operative. And so in any one situation, though, we can have intersections or superposition of these different processes and time scales. So full slip happens like this most of the time. Um, you have a seismic si uh, slip that happens over periods of days, um, diking processes again over periods of days, and, it's, and I added this um, just recently to it from Michael that over uh, periods of thousands of years or so, the glacial loading, and that's actually, as he, he pointed out, is actually a very large force. Um, okay, and then the magma buildup and stress, you know, stress buildup within a magma chamber though is on the time scales where tectonic processes are definitely going to intersect and be, be important. So I, I, I just wanted to add that. Now, I may joke about this a lot. I am just joking. I really don't, um, you know, yeah, anyway, I'm exaggerating just for the point. Um, volcanoes are not cones on top of straws that are in, come down to some pressurized cup down below. And we're well aware that that's not the case. Obviously, to develop analytical models for many situations, we start there. And then we add the complexity when we understand the first order parts of the problem and the system. I'm going to take, though, and I, I love this. I think this is a very beautiful volcano. This is Aldonia Langai, and it was erupting. This is just a little burp one day in 2008. It was doing this for about eight months um, before the caldera collapsed. But what else, um, this is actually Aldonia Langai. Right? So you see this and you think, wow, that's a cool volcano erupting. It's just like this. No. Whoa, what's this? Another volcano, another volcano, another volcano, another volcano. What are these things? Really big faults and there's a big basin adjacent to it. So you can't isolate, in this case, a single volcano without trying to understand the context. And I'm going to come back to this area. You should also talk to Sarah, um, Sarah J. Oliva about some of these processes. But You'll see this little circle right here um, in this volcano. This is an area where we had in 2008, I'll explain the sequence in a second, we had a very complex sequence of a fault episode, a dike intrusion, and a volcanic eruption. So I'll come back to the question that we had before. I'll start off with stress triggering of volcanic systems. Now, towards the end, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'll point out new avenues, new directions, without going in any detail with any method. Um, how um, we can try to understand the pathways through. Now, this is kind of a petrologist perspective. This is Anand et al. Uh, Anand and um, uh, Steve Sparks. I'm not sure who else, the other co op. Hmm? And Blundy. Right. Um, looking at heating and intrusion down here in the bottom, um, it, it's the percent melt present within the crust and the hot zones within the base of the crust. Uh, stacked systems within and multiple pathways leading up to the surface. So intermediate storage and then the eruption. Why I put this in, okay, there's also, um, there's no cumulates anywhere in the system or no, no discussion or real um, identification of cumulates and how they, what we do with them after we extract um, the, the materials as well. And, and so that's like kind of a new part of all of the systems that we need to be considering as well. Uh, but what I wanted to say is that, that we have multiple pathways up through and we're altering the rock on the way. And trying to understand that part and, and what types of cracks and fluids we, we have uh, along the way are, become important in, in determining the rheology of the rocks, the time-dependent behavior. And that's the, you know, one of the biggest limitations when we, we could um, develop um, semi-analytical or numerical models for situations, but we really know little the deeper we go about the compositions and the, and the um, time-dependent behavior of those rocks. Okay, So let me start off with three separate examples of indications where a volcanic eruption or unrest is triggered by a, a, a dike intrusion in this case. So, so we, we can talk about distant earthquakes or dynamic triggering of uh, volcanic eruptions, 
But we can have um, stress triggering then from nearby interactions or even faulting episodes. And, and again, many cases it's hard to see um, how the faulting that's probably induced by injection in one part of the system then may trigger or change the stress state and cause flow of material that then leads to these eruptions. So the first one I'll talk about is in, um, so, so in many cases, oh, sorry, let me step back very quickly. Krapla um, eruptions in Iceland, a uh, whole sequence, inform the world of, of dike intrusions. We know where they happen on mid-ocean ridges, but we saw the sequence and knew that the central reservoir in the center of a, a, a mid-ocean ridge segment was shooting dikes in, in, along the length of the rift in both directions. And I, it, we've seen a diagram, Torsten had a diagram showing that situation. What I'm talking about here that's separate is having a, magma, um, a central segment magma chamber, dikes um, uh, coming off that system and then interacting with other volcanoes in the system. Okay, so in, um, whoops, in 2005, a sequence of events occurred. So I'll just explain. I, Unfortunately, there were very few instruments working, operative at this point in time. So most of the what we know about the very first and the largest dike injection that happened in 2005 come from global records. So there were gas emissions. Simon Karn at Michigan Tech detected large SO2 emissions in this area at about the same time that there were these massive earthquake swarms. And then groups from, um, at, well, our, our great long-term colleague at the Leaeli at the Geophysical Observatory in Addis Ababa alerted us and said, listen, this is our opportunity in Ethiopia to try to build infrastructure because there was this long um, three-day period of almost in, in continuous earthquake activity in the Afar. At that point, we didn't really know what had happened. I'm just going to quickly show you. But I, I, many of us came because we, came, we went with instruments not knowing what, we, what was happening, partly driven by curiosity and partly driven to try to turn this into an opportunity to build infrastructure in, uh, for, for hazard mitigation in Ethiopia. So I, and it was through, through Atalai's vision. What we knew after the fact then was that there was a central magma chamber, chamber that at a, with top at about six kilometers, so more than twice the depth of the Iceland magma chambers. So a, higher pre, um, a deeper depth, a different system, in fact, that fed dikes that went in both directions immediately after. But then at that point, within the two-day period, a 60-kilometer long segment then was lit up with earthquakes and these dike intrusions. One of the dike intrusions came up and curved into Dabahu Volcano, which is this thing sitting up in the, we're, we're right about the mid-second segment, looking up along the length of the rift. And there's a broad uh, volcano at the northern end. So the dike came up, interacted with it, went past it over on the eastern side, um, went by some cooling, highly fractionated, small volume magma chamber, caused an explosion and the eruption of these um, ash and pentelorites from this vent. Uh, and this is the northernmost segment of it. And it stops about at this magma chamber, or at this volcano called Gabhu up at the top. So she just blasted through loads of things along the way. And, that, and it took us a while to figure all this out because there were so many interactions. And that this wasn't the story. Um, that this eruption here um, was relatively minor and accidental um, or because it, it, it interacted along the way. This is an interferogram spanning the time period of the earthquakes that are shown on top. So this was after we got out there. This wasn't the main earthquake sequence. And there were, like I said, there were only a few um, stations, and so the earthquake locations are poor. And, and we can't build a really nice story from them. But what you can say from the interferograms is, ooh, from these, from these interference fringes, we can see, in this case, there were um, su some subsidence at the center of the segment, uh, roughly where we have the magma sources. Um, this is the Bahu volcano that went through a period of inflation and then deflation afterward. A lot of earthquakes happened. It did not erupt, but it was in a period of unrest and uh, probably near critical. This is the shape of the, cur the dike that came up and curved and interacted. This is, this is one of Sandy's beautiful dipping planes that come down. It was 
This defines a nice dipping plane. We can talk about that afterward. And then this is the segment of the dike that moved northward. This is where the eruption site was. And then there was magma drained, or there must have been a source that was tapped with material that moved into the dike or moved away from, the, from a magma chamber here because there was rapid subsidence uh, beneath this volcano. So all of this happened within uh, a period of about six months after the original dike intrusion. So magma source from several different areas, um, whether it joined the flow of the, of the intrusion and whether um, how, what and how that happened remains unclear. All right, uh, because subsequent dikes did not do that. They were just sourced from the center and they didn't, tra none of them traveled this far. But going back to this question about arresting dikes and, and uh, um, at asperities, I'll show you an example of one of those. We've had multiple examples. But go, keep, staying with this idea of stress triggering, um, this is a paper that was just submitted. I, I'm, I'm with, working with Carolina Pegley and uh, Derek Keir and Sang Ho Yoon, uh, where in this top diagram, looking at that, the aftermath of then this sequence with many multiple dike intrusions added, how the stress state will then change. If you think in terms of Coulomb stress, um, that we inject a lot of material, open a zone, what will happen then at the tips of the area then that were, was, was uh, um, where these intrusions occurred? And the cumulative opening is more than eight meters along the entire length of that segment. So the t um, left is the first invariant of the strain rate tensor, and here is the maximum strain rate. And basically, intruding that 60 kilometer long zone causes stress concentrations at the tip, two lobes at the northern end, and it's where we see the seismicity. Uh, so the aftershock sequences and then induced seismicity by the stress concentrations at the northern tips, we see uh, a large zone of earthquake activity here and up to the northern end, and then connect, enabling connection with the next segment, and enabling some strain continuity across. This would be Djibouti just right here, or the Assal Rift is just over here, and with a connection zone uh, um, across the two. Uh, superposed on top of this diagram are predicted earthquake, or uh, simulated earthquake epicenters from a stress concentration, a dog bone shaped uh, stress concentration between the two. So, so the dike itself induces seismicity after, um, through this, this uh, uh, large-scale or tectonic stressing across the zone. Um, we'd hope that we'd have had, I think, I know Paul is well aware, we'd hope that we'd have great state friction uh, in, um, in, in inverse models of this sequence to be able to present at this meeting, but um, one of our colleagues has been delayed um, for a, an extended period of time, so we don't have that, but um, hopefully these will progress in the near future. I, I think also, um, yeah, never mind. Let's keep going. Um, a third example is not proved. It's speculated in this beautiful paper, or the, a title of a paper that I love. Um, Colin Wilson, a student of Colin Wilson's, um, uh, has a paper, The Invisible Hand, tec Tectonic Triggering and Modulation of a Rhyolitic Super Eruption. And their speculation based on the very um, uh, different lava compositions that they find at the edge of the magma, this magma zone. So we're in Taupo. This is New Zealand. We're in a back arc spreading situation, subducting slab going down over here, Taupo, several large volcanoes. And at 27,000 uh, years ago, there was a super eruption. About 530 cubic kilometers of lava were erupted. And they show that there had to have been some chemical mixing from another source immediately prior to that eruption. And so they say that it was a dike intrusion along the length of the rift, something like the Dabahu example, that triggered then this super volcano eruption. So it would be as if the Dabahu volcano then had gone into an eruption and had a much larger magma chamber, more, more fractionated material, and then and, uh, larger gas content and caused a super volcano eruption. So it's possible, but here's, here's one, um, um, another example of the potential for this. Another example of the induced um, of, of stress triggering of a dike intrusion then by faulting processes and then later a volcanic eruption comes in 2008 in an area where we've subsequently done quite a lot of work. And I'll tell you what, what we feel 
is probably the case now that we know the subsurface structure. In 2000, and sorry, in two, this was published in 2008. In 2007, there were a series of large magnitude earthquakes. So that the, um, instead of a main shock aftershock sequence, there were actually uh, several large magnitude, magnitude um, 5.9 earthquakes, um, and then a dike intrusion. And fortuitously, there was a um, uh, what do I, uh, what's it called? The satellite. Uh, anyway, in sorry, I can't remember the, the, the um, which which um, which satellite it was. I'm not I'm drawing a blank. Sorry, somebody help me if they they remember. Um, but it, and here are the interferograms from the first uh, pass immediately after this earthquake, and there's indications of a fault slip on the southern end of this vol volcano called Gelai. There's Old Donulengai. Okay, so it's in between the two of them. Uh, and this was the 5.9 earthquake, and it was simulated by a shallow rupture to the surface along a 45-degree dipping uh, fault plane, but well away from border faults within the basin system. And then immediately afterward, two days afterward, three days afterward, there was a dike intrusion that, in the absence of any information, anyone would say, well, you've got a big volcano there. It's on the southern flank, so it came from a chamber underneath and propagated southward beneath. And then a, mo a month later, well, Without earthquake recordings, activity started at Old Donia and it went into a, three, uh, a nine month period of eruption and then an explosion and caldera collapse within the middle. It's a relatively small. So um, here's another example of these situations. And what we now know from a whole series of experiments, I'm only showing you a very, a, 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 the, the tip of the iceberg. It's a, uh, in terms of data, but there are many groups involved um, there, in, from the US, France, Tanzania, and Kenya. We worked across borders, had instruments on both sides. Uh, these, are, these are the volcanoes. Again, I'm coming back to see this. This is a nice circle, and then beneath it, another, well, almost circle of earthquakes and a cloud of earthquakes that plot then in this way on top of a tomography. This is just one slice from a um, tomography model that's joint inversion of ambient noise tomography, uh, P and S wave arrival times, um, and, uh, and gravity that provides a constraint on the cross mantle boundary that's not very well imaged. Ambient noise gives you a lot of resolution in the upper crust. The uh, P and S arrival times throughout the middle crust and the lower crust isn't very well determined. The gravity is a nice additional constraint. And Steve just sent me a couple days ago, um, so, so here, let me take you through this. We have a large number of earthquakes that are happening in this area. This is where the 2007 dike intrusion occurred. We know the spatial position. We just don't know the earthquake locations particularly well. This is the mechanism for the main, one of the main earthquakes in 2007. It's located here. We think it probably should be right here. And what we're interpreting is a stack sill complex between two volcanoes and above a magma body and the lower crust. And here's a. Uh, persistent zone of seismicity that we are we suggest is a um, zone of uh, a feeding zone rising up to this dike sequence. Here's Odonia Langdai over here that erupts carbonatitic lavas. There's the big fault system bounding the base and crystalline crust in through here, so high velocity against low velocity as you expect across this zone. Um, so we think that what happened in 2007 is that fault that the sill was inflating and a fault, it faulted on the side. That's why it's a shallow, relatively shallow earthquake uh, ruptured to near the surface or to the surface. And then the dike intrusion uh, emanated from the sill and propagated northward into the, into the um, volcanic complex. Just a little bit, went a little bit northward up into the southern edge of this area and through here. Um, we can't prove that, but we're working now reinterpreting the INSAR with uh, Christelle Wautier. So that should provide some really nice insights on these interactions within this layered complex. I think for the interest of time, I'll just skip through this. I, I, this is more time average deformation and showing similar sequences. I, it, what we did in this case um, is a numerical simulation putting high density bodies in bedding high density and in, in lower density continental crust to look to see what, how, where we see stress concentrations along a segmented rift system, and then, enable, and then changing the densities and making them hot, put them in a phase then of activity or replenishment, and seeing that we, they have a tendency to grow or propagate along the length of the rift. So 
Um, stress concentrations um, at the tips of the segments, though, are, are quite important. But I, I don't want to get into that. Um, I don't think we have time. Let me move ahead um, because, right. Uh, now I want to talk a bit more about the sequence in AFR because it goes back then to, to what Torsten was presenting about the dike propagation. And I'll, I'll then say some things about the, um, about the Holoron. Uh, I'll make some comparisons because there's some big differences between the two of them as well. This is just a summary diagram showing all of the dikes that occurred after the main sequence. Some of them they, they emanated from this largely a seismic zone in the middle from a magma chamber with top at about six kilometers. They propagated northward in some instances, and they propagated southward in some instances as well. But they started from here. Fissural eruptions came up in the largely a seismic zone. Uh, uh, fissural, there were three fissural eruptions that came to the surface here from southward propagating dike. Intrusions, and this is just the zone in through here. There's the Dabahu volcano I was telling you about that, that was uh, activated in the first stage. Subsequent dikes never made it that far, and then this sequence here is exactly an example of a stalled dike sequence where it stopped and then restarted again. Um, this is a summary then of the propagations and rates that of, and I'll, I'll show you. There were questions about the magnitudes versus time for dikes. I'll show you. I'll give you and the energy release. Uh, as a related to the propagation, I'll show you diagrams of that in just a second. But this is a summary from Manolo Bellatru's PhD. Uh, this is the center of the, the rift segment where um, beneath the lavas. This is where the fissural eruptions were. You can track those across. They're largely a seismic. So these dikes would po propagate through the fissural eruption or the area where some of the dikes rose to the surface and continue southward uh, at different rates. And Eleonora is going to explain why the cur it, there's not a linear, a straight line, why they're fit with um, curved lines. She, she, she's going to explain more about that, or not? Yeah, I know he did. He did talk about the pressure behind. Well, Eleonora, sorry, Eleonora did this work. It's based on a broken paper of hers. So, okay. Um, I must have been inserting slides at that moment in time. The other point about the dike intrusions is that in this case, there were very large fault scarps created. And so there were hundreds of fault scarps that we mapped from the air. The problem was there were so many earthquakes, it's hard to know whether multiple earthquakes caused the fault slip we see at the surface. But this is a Derek Keir who's about two full meters. So if you use him as a scale, you can see that the displacement, so this is where the fault, this is where the ground surface used to be. This hasn't been sandblasted by the catabatic winds. Um, and this is basalt. So this is solid rock that ruptured. And there then is the, it's a, well over two meters of displacement on this single fault. There are several other fault systems with even more. So up to five meters of slip. Massive piles of rock fall. And if you think about the global catalog of, of um, surface ruptures for normal faults, I think prior to this episode, there had been um, if you exclude mid-ocean ridges, there have been probably um, 17, 20 well-documented normal fault systems um, associated with a single earthquake and aftershock sequence. And yet we have hundreds in this case, and we, we just wish we could do a bit more. But what we do know is, in terms of scaling, that they're very short faults, so large displacement short fault systems that form above the dike. So short meaning maybe 2,000. The mean is 2 to 2.5. Um, uh, kilometer, 2,000 to 2,500 um, meters in length. Uh, and they tip uh, into monoclines at the tips of these fault zones. So interesting surface faulting patterns, and new, um, but largely along pre-existing fractures. This is obviously a pre-existing fracture. There was displacement prior to this. OK, so um, uh, yeah, and you can see the lava flows that they, it, this tips into lava flows at the northern end. These are the um, full moment tensor solutions for the dike sequences. This is from a second paper but from Manolo Bellatru's thesis. I have diagrams. I'll, I'll just quickly show you the magnitude versus time um, of the rate. But this is a distance along the length of the rift from the two largest of the dike intrusions. This November dike propagated southward, stopped uh, for about 12, I think it's 12 hours, and then restarted and moved southward. But 
its first path rose to near the surface. The second segment never reached higher than about six kilometers subsurface. So it remained a deep, much deeper dike than the first part of it, which is a bit confusing after this stall period. So you can see it moved faster at the beginning, and there was a slower rate of propagation after the fact. These red are earthquakes with much lower frequency content. It's and this was something that perplexed us for a while, but we now feel pretty confident about why we have low frequency earthquakes um, during, we have some low frequency earthquakes and some more tectonic earthquakes or with a, a typical spectral content. Uh, how much of it is source and how much is path and how much has to do with rupture to the surface uh, is something that a new student, Gabrielle Tepp, just teased out from the data set. Now, just keeping to time, in this case, uh, earthquakes, this is the earthquake sequence that just recently happened, and I'm sure every, everybody here has talked to Elias now, and who, who, I can't remember the names of the Cambridge students who've been working on this sequence. Wait, what's your name? Sorry. Hmm? Okay. Jay. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, Wait, your last name's Greenwood, right? No. What's your last? Oh, well. Never mind. We'll talk later. OK. Anyway, um, this is from a recent paper. Uh, sorry, Freistein Sigmundson I, is uh, at all. Hmm? Oh, it's OK. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah, why not? <laughs> I don't know how that happened. That's straight from their page. You can see I downloaded it. No. Um, this is a, um, a simple elastic models showing the distribution of opening along the length of the rip with seismicity superposed on top of it. So here's opening in meters, and this is based on um, uh, modeling then of the interferograms and with additional constraints imposed by the earthquake pattern that was interpreted in parallel with the uh, analyses of the interferograms. So you can see that there are patches of much more opening along the length of the rift, and it's segmented, and there's a... Um, but the most important thing that you should notice in this case is that... Oh, sorry, I should have said before that um, there, isn't de there are some diagrams that have depth, but almost all of these earthquakes are occurring at the top of the dike, so in the upper two kilometers of the crust. And uh, very few of them are deeper than that. In Iceland, they're beneath the dike. So the stress concentrations and the brittle deformation are actually in the viscoelastic zone beneath the dike where you wouldn't expect to nucleate earthquakes. So rapid stressing is the most likely explanation for them. But there's not actually a large moment release um, beneath the, the dike zone. And there's virtually no earthquakes at the top, yet there were surface ruptures. So I gave you one example from the upper where almost all the seismic energy is up at the top of the dike and released during, in both cases, the energy is released during the propagation phase, but brittle deformation below versus brittle deformation above, surface faulting with lots of, strain, of, of seismic energy release, brittle, uh, surface faulting with very little. Almost all of the earthquakes in, in this sequence were strike-slip. Whereas they, as I just showed you, they were normal earthquakes with a dilatational component in the AFAR example. Sl much slower opening rates and, um, and, a, and, a, and a deeper source body are some of the uh, contributions, but it's not fully explained and requires considerable, um, uh, much further modeling. And in terms of seismic moment release versus time, I, this is, uh, these are the Afar dikes, that, and they're off the top of the page because there are so many. I'll just take one of these. This is the um, October 2008. There's the November segmented dike. You can see that there are low frequency earthquakes throughout the sequence, uh, well, barely any during the second deeper part, and that's important. And then here, uh, almost all of the energy occurs during the propagation. So almost all the earthquakes happen as you're moving the dike, as Torsten explained, that that's where the stress concentrations are along the edges of these blade-shaped dike systems. And the, the, um, you, you can see there are some probably aftershocks then or to the surface faulting in, 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 at the same latitude, but this is as they propagate along. And so almost all the energy is released during the propagation phase. And you can see the magnitudes of the earthquakes then. They're all scaled to magnitude on this diagram. 
Now, I said something about low-frequency earthquakes. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about this in just a second because this links back. Um, one of the, uh, how, many, how many of you have heard about low-frequency earthquakes on volcanoes? How many of you study low-frequency earthquakes on volcanoes? Oh, just a couple. Okay, but you all are aware. And then, mo okay, so, so what's the, what are low-frequency earthquakes caused by? It's, it's not a rhetorical question. What, what have you been taught? What, it, what do you, what, how, if you know about them, what's the association you make? Hmm? Fluids. Fluid. Right. So it's, it's, it's faulting with fluids involved, causing a slower, um, potentially slower slip, slower rupture durations, uh, source time functions uh, that are causing then this frequency reduction along the, within the zone. Now here's a dike. We're not in the volcanic edifice. Okay. It's a slightly simpler problem in some ways in terms of the rupture. So I'm going to take this apart. And in this case, in the AFAR, what we had, we had, this is an earthquake from roughly, uh, within a kilometer, the same location received on the same station. So this earthquake versus this, this earthquake, then you'd say it must have a source effect. Well, there's also a shallow effect and surface rupture component of these. And so, well, well, I'll give you the short version of this that Gabrielle Tapp, who's now with the earthquake, that, okay. yeah? But the magnitudes are comparable in this case? I, I mean, to show you, um, in the case, well, they're, they're, um, there's not a large difference. None of the earthquakes are very large, uh, greatly in magnitude. In our magnitude, I'm, I'm only showing you larger earthquakes within these sequences. I can't tell you exactly what these are. I can tell you afterward, but it's not a huge difference, and that does not explain this. Okay, so there, so you're completely right. Frequency, um, the frequency of the earthquake is dependent on magnitude. So in order of magnitude difference in the in the um, magnitude. Scale will lead to a reduction in the dominant frequencies. The, these are, um, that is not the case, and I can show you example after example. We, we've cl cl um, carefully examined that effect, and that's not at all what's happening here. Okay. Um, so, so these are s suggested ideas. I think that, from what I understand, a lot of volcanology meetings in the past have had heated debates about what the cause of the low frequency earthquakes are and what. Very long period versus long period versus different the different frequency contents and what they can possibly mean, and whether it's resonance within the chamber or organ pipe modes or um, uh, gas escape, and then also too, as very slow rupture velocities and for shallow earthquakes that rupture in the surface um, with really slow velocity material, really loosely compacted material in the surface, they rupture very slowly and also have a low frequency content because of the slow rupture velocities in those cases. And those, if you're interested in those, read Chris Bean's papers. There are several of them, and they're, they, you know, they're really enlightening. And then, um, they're both um, observations and numerical simulations of the um, uh, rupture propagation. So, so in a way, the so way we looked at it is then that the ground motion, or in, in, in turn the velocity, it, everyone knows from intro seismology that you have a source time function. You have a propagation or, pa or path effect because it has to go through that hot material with lots of fluid-filled cracks to get to the station to be recorded. So how it gets to the station in many ways becomes really important. In the AFAR area, kind of funny story, got dropped by helicopter, didn't know what we had. One team went south and was supposed to walk until an hour and a, walk for an hour and a half as far as they got, put a seismometer in the ground. The other team was supposed to walk in the opposite direction. My team um, couldn't find a good place to put the seismometer, so we went up a little fault scarp and put the seismometer there. And we accidentally had one station on one side of the dike and another station on the opposite side of the dike intrusion when we figured out what had happened. And so we measured the largest ever attenuation values across the dike system by earthquakes from outside the system. So we have hugely attenuating material on either at, that within these areas near the dike zones and fracture and fluid fill, particularly immediately after um, the intrusion of a dike. And then the station terms, and those are, those are things we can deal with. But it's the trying to look at, at, at that part. So, so let me just show you 
Gabrielle put this slide together for me. She, had, she made it really cool so that you could see all pieces together, but I couldn't get it to work. Um, it, what are the ways? So, so this is a t an earthquake and the spectral response of a low frequency earthquake, a hybrid earthquake, and a high frequency earthquake within a particular um, area. And if you look at the spectra, you can say the spectra are different. But if I tell you what's the peak frequency, hmm, what's the peak frequency of this one? What do you mean by peak? Which peak? How do you want to classify or characterize any of these earthquakes? One of the ways that you can make it so that a group from one institution can compare with another institution is to use um, a frequency index and just take, take the ratio of the high frequency component to the low frequency component after carefully assessing and finding examples to see whether you can classify or find subclasses or differences within your earthquake sequences. And I could point you to, to these two papers that Gabrielle's written, or Michael West and a group at the Alaska Volcano Observatory have been using this for a while, and I think other groups are adopting it. But it certainly enables comparison and reduces some of these debates that are in, in some way as a bait, based on the way that you treat your data. It's a uniform and clear way of treating data sets. And so you can see then that we can classify these earthquake sequences. OK, so you know the path effects, 3D velocity structure go around the low, velo low velocity zones along the path. Um, right paths will, uh, will um, turn uh, laterally, too. We have scattering, attenuation, anisotropy, and um, also, uh, well, the VPVS, uh, uh, let me, um, that's for later. So these are normalized um, to the same scale, but they're, they're uh, on the same station and different earthquakes from the same spots. So at the same areas, and these, these are from two different dikes, the October dike and the November dike, and just showing the differences in frequency content, uh, received at the same spot. And what Gabrielle was able to find out, in, um, and so these are the different sequences characterized by the frequency index, OK? I'm just saying that we have the lowest frequency earthquakes during the dike propagation phase, and they're from the largest magnitude earthquakes that are ruptured to the surface. So the low frequency earthquakes in this situation are um, in, in, in if the, or sorry, and no bimodal distribution instead of continuum from the lo uh, low frequency to the high frequency. So varying degrees of path effects then are changing the uh, spectral content remarkably along the way, uh, along without this uh, this change. So it, 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 the lowest frequency earthquakes rupture at the top, or we assume they rupture at the top of the dike. They're at they're located at the same spot as the top of the dike and ruptured to the surface. They may be slow slip, um, but I'll explain in a second. Um, sorry, but I think that's, hopefully this is clear to you then where we are. But the most important piece here, these are the normalist earthquakes. So that when they're this yellow color, they look, they're a tectonic earthquake. When they're this color down here, when they have the frequency index, the negative frequency index, then they're very low frequency. And this, this part, here, you can see these two, these are the two deepest dikes. And so the, the earthquake rupture depths are the deepest in the whole sequence, and they have the uh, highest frequency content. So we, we had the benefit of being able to compare multiple dike sequences with different characteristics on the same stations and be able to see these patterns. Um, the other thing that we know from this area is that we also must have lots of fluid-filled cracks as well. This is Derek Keir's work on a, a, a really beautiful paper um, looking at, he also inverts then for the fracture density. Um, and, and these are from local earthquakes recorded on a station we temporarily we hand carried out to the middle of the rift. And when folks camped there for two weeks, recorded earthquakes. And he was able to measure the direction of anisotropy from shear wave splitting from little local earthquakes. And the amount of splitting is actually very large. So um, three to six percent anisotropy. They're all normal on the right-hand side. They're normalized by the depth because you'll so you have an earthquake, and the um, if there's uh, anisotropy, then the two s you you have a, a three-component seismograph. You'll have a fast direction and slow direction. You'll be able actually um, sorry the the um, in looking at the shear waves then they're passing through this media. Um, you'll be able to see if there's a lag in a, a directional lag. And one of the things that we, um, he was able to, to see that there's actually large amounts of splitting and it's all rift parallel. So these are 
fractures, and they're superposed on, this, on the fault map as well. So there are some local variations that correlate very nicely with these fractures that we can see at the surface too. So a lot of this then must mean that there's gas and fluids along um, these paths, as we already knew. Uh, and, they, and we can also get some idea using compliance um, techniques uh, invert to see what the fracture density might be as well. So we're extracting more and more information from these well-planned experiments, or for, you know, for, from extract, taking um, in, in detailed analyses of these earthquake swarms. Um, okay, I didn't mean to imply though that in all places they are. Um, we have um, that we have a continuum. This is near Gongo, and it's at, Hawaii is the same. If we take the frequency index of earthquakes, there's a recent paper by, um, I think it's Robin Matosa, on, um, and another, oh, I can't remember the authors now. I, I can tell you afterward. But uh, they, they see a similar, sequen similar pattern on Hawaii, the low frequency earthquakes and the a bimodal distribution of frequency index. And these low frequency earthquakes in near Gongo, on this diagram, the, on one side are the SO2 gas emissions detected by satellite. Okay, so these are, these are the earthquake number of earthquakes on the right-hand side versus the SO2 emissions, and the low-frequency earthquakes happen when we have large amounts of SO2 gas escaping from this open conduit in near Gongo. So we can correlate these guys with probably a very distinct process. Um, so trying to extract these, the, the summary here, Dike-induced earthquakes um, with an enhanced low frequency content. Well, you can read this. Um, we should see a broad continuum, but differences from place to place. So squeezing um, more information um, from, from studying the swarms and making comparisons across provides a lot of in uh, information. And again, the independent observations and collaboration with uh, taking the information from other methods, the SO2 gas emissions, for example, talking to the gas folks, I've learned more, well, as much, I don't want to say too much. I learned um, as much as I do from talking to another seismologist. So it's very important to try the multidisciplinary approaches to, to uh, volcano research. Um, now, the second part I think that is relevant, particularly to what we've been talking about, and Eleonora promised that I'd talk about lower crustal earthquakes. The lower crust, as you know, you've all been taught, right? The lower crust is granulites, probably um, maybe wet granulites, and it's pretty weak. Continental crust in most places where we're studying the volcanoes, and yet we can have earthquakes in the lower crust. And in some cases, I'll show you, when we're in extensional environments in particular, we can have Large, some of the largest magnitude earthquakes in the, in the area are in the lower crust. Okay, so are they, is it because we have a really strong lower crust? It's really cold, it's very mafic material, and so it can store stresses for a long period of time, and, and so build to a large magnitude earthquake. Okay, that's one possibility. But how much of it has to do with rapid stressing from the release of fluids and the transport of fluids? And I, I, so I'll give you some examples. So, so I'm sure everybody's seen a Christmas tree diagram, right? Has anybody not seen a Christmas tree diagram? I don't see anything more. These are different curves for different compositions, different fluid contents. You know, it varies drastically by fluid content. So you can see in some cases in the lower crust here, you have virtually no strength, depending on what, you, what the composition of the lower crust is. Okay. So if we pass a dike through the lower crust, so, uh, why, why am I worrying about the lower crust? Magma's rising up through the lower crust, right? We want to understand those pathways from the source zones in the mantle up through to the surface. How can we extract that information? We're making progress is, I think, the answer, but we don't, or is where we stand, but I don't think we have answers. So one area, Julie Alberic in, in, um, in France, it, she was in, um, in Brest and is uh, now working on shallow earthquakes elsewhere are on hydraulic fracking. Um, look, mapped out, and this, uh, this is a yield stress envelope for an area, assuming that there's, a very, that there's a very mafic lower crust in the area. Now, I think our new observations, this was before we did our, uh, this new experiment in the area, uh, it, it's most likely not diabase or wet diabase in the lower crust. But this is a yield stress envelope that you predict to be able to explain the large number of lower crustal earthquakes. And these earthquakes are very well determined and they match the patterns. So local earthquakes match the patterns of teleseisms and they're frequent teleseismic earthquakes in this area. It's the largest um, seismic energy release in all of East Africa. 
And we, most of the earthquakes then are occurring at about depths of about 30 kilometers. And, and Julie thought that it was the release and transport of, of CO2 from the metasomatizing mantle rising up through and causing, um, hydraulic, uh, 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 causing higher elevated pore pressures. And that would then um, predict some interesting characteristics in the VPVS that we are testing. Now, when we did our experiment in the area where I showed you, where we have lots of magmatic centers just to the north, we also had loads and loads of deep earthquakes. And there are two colors of diagrams. is because we relocated earthquakes using a multiple, multiple methods, 3D velocity models, the entire data set, double difference. And they all show system, no systematic variations in the depth distribution. Um, we also know that there's an area in here where if we elevate temperature in the lower crust, we can have um, some changes in the in the um, uh, uh, in the pyroxene that may uh, cause an increase in velocity as well. These bars are just showing. Oh, those bars moved. The bars that bar is supposed to be right there. That's the bar showing where the telesizms are. Uh, the telesizms were in here. This is an area without magmatism in Tanganyika, where um, Aude Lavoisier is working with us. And I, I, um, I'll come back to that in a second. But even deeper earthquakes and bimodal distributions as well. So I think as we keep going, I know that you're all antsy to go have your coffee, but I only, I'm, I'm keeping, trying to keep to time. When we um, make cross sections, okay, of what we have from our earthquakes, we have border fault systems, and in this case, so I'm in a rift zone. I have a volcano just out of the plane of this diagram, so I'm, I'm skipping the volcano for the time being because I want to try and understand the system and the tectonic setting before I interpret the volcanoes. The volcano setting, these are base of crest from receiver functions, and I have numbers for VPVS. VPVS, when it's higher than about one point, well, in this area, the mean or the background is about 1.7. And so anything elevated then may indicate uh, mafic material in the lower crust. Um, and, and the presence of fluids that reduces S wave velocities more than the P waves. Okay, so you have high P waves but reduce S wave velocities, and, and, it, and um, Poisson's ratio is directly proportional to the VPVS squared. Okay, um, but in this case, uh, uh, really clever folks, Toby Fisher and two students um, went out. Uh, James Muirhead and Yun Woo Lee went out and made gas measurements all along the area uh, that we were studying. Let me go back. Do I have a diagram? No. OK. Anyway, they went all up along, away from the volcanoes, just to see what kind of gas emissions they were measuring, and measured the some of the largest ever soil gas measurements of CO2, even more than there are determined, have been determined in Campi Flegri, okay, directly above a volcano, coming up these fault systems. Um, we also have lower crustal earthquakes, and we see that many of those earthquakes are directly uh, at the tip of where we project the border faults at depth. And we're suspecting then that we have gas release from magma intrusions. We know that it's magmatic CO2, so we're catching the magma intrusion from the gas emissions. And we know that it's happening. And then we have lower crustal earthquakes in the same places. So we're associating the two of them um, and, and then using VPBS and crustal velocity uh, variations in these areas as well. These are where the same earthquakes are, and we see this low velocity zone over here. We, it's a magma chamber. This is associated with the basin. These are v, VS. It, you can't just directly translate this because you have compositional variations as well. I'd be happy to talk about those. So these are the gas measurements of the areas. They went along the fault systems and found very lo hot, large fluxes in these areas. These are similar to what's have been measured in Kempi Flagrate here. Um, and their, their mantle source fluids, some, uh, the enhancement from the metasomatism. Um, and these numbers then, uh, if we extrapolate them over the Eastern Rift or 11% of the global budget, I'm sure that this area is in a high early stage and a flush, so this is probably an overestimate. But, um, you know, anyway, microseisms and saline fluids maintain permeable pathways for these fluids um, along the fault systems as well. And we have active degassing that's enhancing the process. And just to put it in context, the biggest polluters of CO2 near Gongo, Mount Etna, Nakajima here, and oh look, number four is actually a basin away from the volcano. So large volumes of magma being intruded during this early stage rift zone. Uh, 
I don't think I have too much time. This is from the receiver function work and just saying that we are seeing high VPVS in the lower crust in these areas, low, reduced velocities up in the, mantle, in the upper mantle, and actually getting reflections from within the mantle system. This is Christelle Tiberi and um, Matthew Plasman. Um, it's just been submitted. I don't have a lot of time except to say that know your stresses. In this case um, that I was talking about in northern Tanzania, we have a, this is the uh, predicted plate opening vector from geodetic data. This is the um, earthquake. This is a summation or cost of summation of all the mechanisms that we have in this sector. It's sub east west. And there's a, see, there's a large uh, bound. On the plate opening, there's few geodetics, continuous GPS in East Africa. So north and south, we have roughly parallel to the plate opening, and we have a 90-degree rotation within the area where we have the sill complex, the magmatic systems, and you can see in these mechanisms in through here, and the telecytons from the dike intrusion show us exactly the same thing. We're working on the hypothesis that we have magma intrusion behind the fault systems as pre um, pre predicted by Ferry et al., and um, so coming up behind, it's driven by the basin system and the pressure differential and the, the um, body forces induced by the surface topographic loading and the intrusive bodies is uh, in, uh, contributing to the stress rotation in this area. It's a working hypothesis and requires some complex modeling. Okay, so I, I've just said that. I don't have too much time just to say that that the presence of fluids like CO2 or gases along fault zones, this is an example from shallow levels, you can see that it uh, reduces the plates, the strength um, significantly. Finally then, um, I just wanted to say that we, you know, we're suspecting that when we go to areas without magmatism, we see lower crustal earthquakes and the similar types of patterns, high VPVS ratios in the lower crust, that in, in fact the amagmatic western rift, we, it, Maybe in an instance where the magma intrusion is just starting, it's at lower crustal levels, and it may be a way to detect those. And I think I just want, yeah, so I was just going to say some things about BP, VPVS. Um, let me leave then with this. Nobody else, nobody has said anything about MT. There's no one else here. I just want to emphasize that there's a, also a very important point in trying to take multiple methods and magnetotellurics um, uh, are well, high, very well suited uh, uh, to detect fluids and the, the nature of those fluids, whether it's aqueous or magmatic, the conductivity variations are very strong within these areas. This is the Dabahu area with earthquakes here, the uh, high conductivity zones, some of the highest um, measurements that predict more than 10% melt within these magma chambers and a large volume within the area. And these are comparisons then with uh, receiver functions and um, waveforms providing some um, comparisons of where we would place the base of the crust versus the magma bodies and helping us to understand, just as folks have done in the Andes with large volume magma chambers, trying to make comparisons between the multiple methods. So I'm just showing that, that MT blow up the MT, seismic, gravity, and then INSAR derived models. This is where they place the body as well. We need to place these together so that we can get past the non highly non-unique models that can explain the INSAR, the surface deformation patterns alone, uh, to try to get at what's down there and how it's moving and changing over time. Thank you.